Hallelujah. Eternal destiny. Turn to the book of 2 Peter, first chapter, verse 3 to 4. 2 Peter, first chapter, verse 3 to 4. Here we have a spiritual principle from God's Word dealing with what God has dispensed to His people, what He's given to His people, that we might thrive and we might grow and we might be fruitful. And here we read <clears throat> verses 3 to 4, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So the first thing we find out is the principle that in God's word we have received everything, all things. We partake of God's word, we come across the understanding, the knowledge of God. And then he goes on, verse 4, whereby, or in other words, through the knowledge we are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the promises in the word of God, <clears throat> which come from the knowledge of God, will enable us to conquer, overcome, all opposition. The problem that we have is that Christians are ignorant of the promises that would free them of the situations and the trials that they're going through. You see an example of those that took promises and ran with it. Turn to Hebrews, 11th chapter. Hebrews, 11th chapter. When you get there, we want verses 13. Down to verse 16. Talking about those that received promises, applied them to their life, and it changed their lives. Now, Abraham received these promises from the Lord, and he passed them down to his descendants. And everyone that partook of the promises benefited from them. Hebrews 11, we're going to pick it up in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Why didn't they receive them? Because the promises are eternal. But they received the temporal aspect of the promises. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For well, they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have opportunity to have returned. In other words, Abraham came from Earl Chaldees. He could have wanted to return back to where he came from, but he turned his back on that, and he was focusing on not where he came from, but where he was going, where God was taking him, what his future, what the promises would provide for him, in this life and in eternity. Verse 16, But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Peter talks about great and precious promises that come from the knowledge of the word of God into the life. And if we appropriate these promises, if we take them and embrace them and make them ours, he says, we will escape the things, the traps, the snares, the pitfalls of this life, just as Abraham and his descendants escaped the pitfalls of the life 
of their generation, of their time, because their focus was on the promises. Now we see some applications of people that took these promises and ran with them. We'll take a look at Moses. Turn to Hebrews 11, verses 24 to 25. Hebrews 11, which you're in, one verses 24 to 25. Abraham was a recipient of the promises that were given to, uh, I mean, Moses was a recipient of the promises that were given to Abraham, passed down to the generation. Notice what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had recompense with respect unto the recompense of the reward. In other words, when Abraham was taken to his mother to be weaned <coughs> by uh, Pharaoh's sister, she instilled the promises of Abraham. Moses took these promises and he analyzed what he could get in this life, the throne of Egypt, the riches, the power, the glory, all what he could get from following God, God's word, God's promises. And Moses chose the latter. He knew he would pay a price to be identified with the downtrodden slaves of Goshen was more appealing to Moses because he knew ultimately that the reward for being faithful to God's word would be far greater than the riches of Egypt. This illustrates a principle. What is the principle? The principle is the saint is instructed to evaluate his life by the promises of the things that are given in God's word. We should do the same thing that Moses did. Pursue the word of God, the promises that Peter talked about, learn them, apply them, and then analyze what they will give you as compared to what this world will give you. And when you come to the conclusion that you'll get far more from the promises of God and God's word than you will ever get from pursuing the things of this world, it will anchor you, it will strengthen you, it will give you a vision which will never die, which you can pursue, which will hold you up in the time of the greatest stress, the time of the greatest trial, the time of the greatest tribulation. Your focus will be on those promises, just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's focus was on the promises, and they remained steadfast throughout the trials that were coming their way in this life. Now, Scripture teaches the Spirit, Holy Spirit, will show the saint the positive side of a negative experience. <clears throat> when you're looking at life, the reason, one of the reasons Christians go down is because they can only see the negative things that are happening in their life and that the enemy will take and he will drive that uh, like an unending weight upon them until the point where they crack and they fall. The Holy Spirit will show us a positive in every negative we can experience. Turn to 2 Corinthians, 4th chapter, verse 17 to 18. Here we see how Paul looked at the things he had to deal with, the challenges, the negative experiences. Paul began to see them through the eyes of Christ, through the eyes of God, and he saw them radically different than he would ordinarily through the eyes of the senses. Second Corinthians, fourth chapter, verses 17 to 18. For a light affliction, so that's the first thing he's seeing. But this is not uh, something that's going to destroy me. This is an affliction which in comparison is light. And Paul underwent his share of afflictions and trials. So he writes, everything I've undergone, I look at it as a light, temporary affliction. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul is illustrating the principle of seeing the things that happen to you in the physical from a spiritual perspective. Seeing the things in the temporal from an eternal perspective. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen. In other words, the word look there is basically focus. <coughs> um, <coughs> reach a stage of um, discerning and concentrating on. While we focus not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, they're temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So when we undergo trials and circumstances because of our stand for Christ, our walk for Christ, Christ's life that we're living, and these things seem to be unjust, they seem to be egregious, they seem to uh, demand great things from us. If we look from a spiritual perspective, we will find if we remain steadfast, faithful, going about the, 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 the things of the Lord in that trial, it is going to work out for us a greater weight of glory. For every negative, there is a positive. And the Holy Spirit will give us a positive perspective of a negative experience. Jesus did not look at going to the cross from a negative experience, although it was pain, suffering, agony beyond which we could possibly begin to imagine. Jesus looked at going to the cross from a positive perspective, and then nobody will ever experience a trial of that magnitude. If he could see positive in that trial that he was going through, then our trials are child's play in comparison. And there is a positive view that we can take from each and every circumstance that we undergo. If we have not initiated it from the perspective of sin, but if it is as a result of our living for Christ and being faithful to God, the positive will always outweigh the negative. Says that the joy set before him was going to the cross. Exactly. He was looking at what we get. Exactly. And it gave him joy. That's it. The way that he was going to save us. He's going to reconcile a race back to the Father. Praise the Lord. Turn to Philippians. <clears throat> First chapter. Verse 12 to 18, seeing the positive and a negative experience. Philippians, the first chapter, verses 12 to 18. Here we see an example. Paul rejoicing in a negative consequence. This, but I would ye understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Paul's in jail, writing to the church on the outside. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. <clears throat> some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, some also of good will. So Paul, first off, is saying that he's in jail for preaching, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. But he's assuring the church. He says, church, there's only good that's come out of this because the gospel has gone forth. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> It stayed, it's, uh, it's believed that when Paul was in jail and he had two guards on either side, they had to keep changing his guards because he was converting them to Christianity. Verse 14, many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word 
without fear. So this illustrates a principle. Your brothers and sisters are looking at your stand for Christ. And if they see you faithful, even though it's costing you, it's going to inspire them. This is exactly what Paul is saying. He's saying those, those brethren that may have been waving because they see my steadfastness are bold to go forth and speak the word of God. Then he goes on to something else. He says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. So what he's saying here is that those, the gospel is being preached, some sincerely preaching the gospel, others preaching it in derision, criticism. But he's making a point here. He says in either case, the gospel is going forth. People are hearing it. People are being saved. Verse 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So he's making an illustration here of a negative situation in which he only sees positive. Now, none of us that I know of have been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. So the things that we experience are going to be on a lesser scale. The things that we experience daily if we begin to see the positive in that, and the Holy Spirit will quicken us to the positive of a negative situation, in that negative situation we can rejoice, we can be strengthened, we can go forward in confidence because we can see the positive of a negative situation. There are, situ there are Christians, unfortunately, that are so beaten down because all they see is a negative of their circumstance that the enemy capitalizes on it. Satan will jump in at both feet and try to make it more negative than it actually is. But if we turn that around and we can see by the stand that we are taking, we're glorifying God, people are being blessed, God's being glorified, that will give us a strength, a joy, and a positiveness to break the shackles that ordinarily would bind us and to go forth in an even greater way, with a greater assurance that whatever takes place, God's going to be glorified. Amen. Amen. Which brings us to the next principle. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Never excuse for a pity party, although we have our share of them. The saint is instructed to see this life as it really is, a brief period of time in which we're passing through. Turn to the book of James, the fourth chapter, verses 13 to 17. James 4, verses 13 to 17. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So James, on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us we need to see our life and our time from God's perspective. Tomorrow is promised to no one. We live one day at a time. And if we open our eyes tomorrow to see the sun come up, it's because only of the grace of God. So we live each day to the fullest. Many people are living as though they're going to definitely be here six months, a year from now, making plans that might or might not come to fruition. That's in God's province. We're only a heartbeat away from stepping into eternity. 
And the Holy Spirit is reminding us we need to see our life in that perspective. <clears throat> we find <clears throat> for what? For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live. Do this or that. In other words, our life is in God's hands. And if it's his will for us to wake up tomorrow, praise the Lord. But there's no guarantee. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So the Lord will quicken us very quickly to us presuming things that aren't to be taken for granted. We do not want to stand before God having been guilty of taking him or anything about him for granted. There's a thing called presumptuous sin. I can do this and know that God will forgive me for it. No, he won't. He forgives us as we truly are sorry for what we do, but when we premeditate something, put ourselves aside from that, and that borders on pride and arrogance. Yes. You know, the only way that you have life beyond today, it says, you know, don't look to the future because it could be over today. Because if the Lord tells you, when Paul was in Jerusalem, Jesus appeared to him, said, You have witnessed for me in Rome. When he was in Yerachadon in the storm, dying, all hope was gone, he wasn't afraid. He knew he couldn't die. Exactly. Because he had to witness at Rome. Yes. So he knew until that was over with. So if God promised you something and you knew for sure it was him, had a ministry for you or a place for you ten years from now, you know you can't die. Oh, yeah. Now because he can't lie. Definitely. But that's the only way. Yes. Yes, definitely. And we don't take God for granted. Philippians, second chapter, verses 12 to 15. This is an attitude that we should have about our life. <clears throat> Philippians second chapter twelve to fifteen. Where wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That work for it, you already have it, but work it out with an attitude of fear and trembling. You don't take your life and your time here for granted. Everything is at the grace of God. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So our life is not ours. It belongs to God. God has things he wants to do through us. We are merely vessels that the master uses to bring about his will in the earth. And that's the attitude we should have. And in that respect, our time is not ours, it belongs to God. Our life is not ours, it belongs to God. Everything we have, we own nothing. We're stewards only of what God has put within our safekeeping. And he can take it away anytime he wants. He's sovereign over all things. Do all things without murmurings and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are vessels through whom God works to show his reality to a dying world that's in darkness. And as we yield to him the things he wants to do through us, he becomes, he works greater and greater and greater things to that vessel that becomes more and more yielded to him. 
And we begin to gain a greater and greater understanding, comprehension of God, God's will, God's way, and the things of God. 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verses 9 to 10. This should be uppermost in the mind of every saint. 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verses 9 to 10. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Live a life, whether you're in his presence or in his absence, is pleasing in his sight. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. <coughs> We're going to have to give an account of everything we've done in this life how we have spent the time, how we have <clears throat> handled the word of God, how we have related to our brothers and sisters. We have to give an account for everything one day before the Lord. And we should live each day with that uppermost in mind. <clears throat> Finally, turn to Psalms 90. Verses 10 to 12. Psalms 90, verses 10 to 12. <clears throat> The days of our years are threescore years and ten, seventy years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet it is their strength, yet is their strength and labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our day, prioritize our time, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, that we may live wisely in the time that we have been given. Because one day we're going to have to give an account of the time spent here. So in closing, understand, time is not ours, our life is not ours, possessions are not ours. <coughs> It all belongs to Christ. And as we live our days as yielded vessels to him, we come into a situation where we see the promises of God become more and more coalesced in our life. We are given a greater and greater degree of favor by God. We become more and more used of God be a blessing to others. It becomes a win-win situation. It doesn't mean we won't have more problems. Probably will. More trials. Probably will. You know, much is given, much is required. But we have the promises of God that will sustain us, enable us to overcome all obstacles, and ultimately bring us to the throne of God. We will hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we want. That's the, the, the path that we want to tread. It leads us to the presence of the Lord and to see him favor us with open arms, inviting us into the kingdom for eternity. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us to pursue this vision. Help us, Lord, to understand the shortness of time. Help us, Lord, to understand and to see things from your perspective your, your will, your way, let it be paramount in our lives. Help us to be about the master's business while we can, for we know the time is short. And Father, we just thank you and praise you for the opportunities you've given us, you will give us on a daily basis. Let us glorify you in a greater and greater way each day. And Father, we'll give you the praise, the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Amen. Thank you.